Boys, girls, here's fun for you. It's a secret. We can tell you now, but be sure to visit your Rio Grande gasoline dealer early in September. He has a big surprise for you, and it's free. <laughs> Calling All Cars, a copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Welcome to police calling all cars, attention all cars. Special attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars. Broadcast 91. Trace down all blonde girls missing in Los Angeles during the past two months. Information is needed to assist in identification of a torso found today in the Los Angeles River. That's all. Rolls and quick. When you hear the scream of the siren and police cars go tearing past, let it remind you that more police cars use Rio Grande cracked gasoline than any other brand. Fire! Fire! When the alarm sounds, when the huge fire trucks race through the streets, they are using Rio Grande cracked the gasoline that powers more fire engines than any other brand. There goes the ambulance. A case of life or death. Speed, power at any cost. And Rio Grande cracked gasoline is used by ambulances more than any other brand. In fact, wherever it is sold, Rio Grande cracked gasoline powers more emergency equipment of every kind than any other gasoline. Why? Because only with cracked gasoline can modern high compression engines develop their greatest speed and power. Your car, too, will give police car performance with Rio Grande Crack Gasoline. And now we are pleased to present Eugene Biscalou, Sheriff of Los Angeles County. Good evening, friends. If I were to be asked what is the most important requisite for a detective, I think I should answer attention to detail. It is upon the apparently unimportant little things that many a case has hinged. Those slight facts which the untrained eye will pass by as of no value, a slight smudge upon a coat which might be blood, the faint impression of a heel on the ground, the almost imperceptible mannerism of the speech of a suspect. From such things does important evidence often develop. Our men are trained never to overlook such details. When they investigate a case, nothing is too small nor insignificant to be considered unimportant. In the case you are about to hear, the criminal was diabolically clever. Our problem before we could even begin searching for the murderer was to discover the identity of the victim. The entire case depended from a single human hair, the only clue we had, and from that hair, we developed a case which resulted in the necessary identification and from that, the eventual capture and conviction of the murderer. One afternoon in early April a few years ago, a young man walking along the bed of the Los Angeles River near Linwood Gardens makes a gruesome discovery which sets into motion the extremely complicated machinery of modern criminology when it faces an almost clueless crime. A few hours after the discovery, Captain William Bright, head of the county homicide detail, is in conference with Sheriff Biscalou. Well, Sheriff, I have a nice and soluble mystery I'm working on. No, there isn't any such thing. <laughs> of course you're right. But this one is tough. Well, what is it? A couple of hours ago, a woman's torso was found in the Los Angeles Riverbed near Linwood Garden. Head, arms, and legs had been cut away from the body. Whoever committed the murder wanted to make sure there could be no identification. Mm, apparently. Any scars, identifying marks? No, there's just one clue. What's that? 
A single hair from the right armpit. A blonde hair. Well, that's better than nothing. According to Gumpert, the technician, the woman was between 20 and 30 years of age. The torso had apparently been buried in the river sand. In this last rain, it roasted downstream, so there's no telling where it was originally buried. I've got a detail of men out in the riverbed right now searching for the missing members of the body. Good. Been to the morgue myself, looking at the remains. Didn't learn much from them, though. As I see it, our first problem is to get an identification. And we've only got a single hair to work on. Which isn't going to be easy. Well, I'll get the boys from the newspapers and ask their help. This is one case where we need plenty of publicity. Well, that's the story, boys. As far as we've investigated, I've got a detail of men out in the riverbed now looking for the missing parts and also searching for a murder weapon. That's the damn beautiful, Bill. Go down to the morgue and take a look. Your guess is as good as mine. Makes a better story if you call a young and so. Call her anything you like and play the story up as big as you can. There's only one thing I want you to do for me. Yeah, what's that, Bill? Play up a request for relatives of missing blonde women to communicate with this office. And whenever possible, to send in samples of the missing women's hair. Why? What's the hair for? Well, this single hair we found on the torso is the only clue we have. And I'm convinced we can get a reasonable identification from that one hair. What's in the paper tonight, Herbert? Oh, nothing. Very dull. Baseball season open. Stock market's up again, that's about all. Herbert, you're keeping something from me. Why should I keep anything from you? Let me see that paper. Oh, Herbert, look. They found a girl's body, a blonde girl. Herbert, do you suppose, Louise? Did you see the nice paper? Sure, what about it? They found an unidentified body of a blonde in the riverbed. Uh, so what? So this. My mother and dad have worried plenty about me since I ran away with you. But now they'll they think I'm dead. I'm going home. Yeah, but Stella. Listen, I'm going back and face them. You can come with me or not, but I'm not going to cause them any more worry. Oh, well, after the evening papers carry the request for aid from the citizens, samples of blonde hair begin to pour into the sheriff's office. Frenzied parents throng to the morgue and try to identify the gruesome section of the mystery court. More than 300 samples of blonde hair are compared by criminologist Gompert with the hair from the torso. In two weeks, during which false clues are vainly pursued, 50 runaway girls are found by authorities or returned to their homes of their own volition. Day after day, the newspapers, cooperating to the limit, run the repeated request for information regarding missing women. The imagination of the public is caught. Thousands of citizens, per amateur detective, and swamp the sheriff's office with the reports of their findings. But as the weeks pass, that one identifying hair does not appear. Captain Bright and Captain Stenson will recapitulate their problems. Well, to begin with, we've got the hair. That's a very important clue. Then the measurements of the body give us an idea of medium height. The coroner reports that the dissection was done by someone familiar with anatomy. Yes, that's right. Any reports of persons missing from doctors' families? Only three, and all of them brunettes. Just look at this file. You think everyone in Los Angeles County was missing? Yes? Sorry to disturb you, Captain, but there's a rather distressed citizen out here to see you. Well, something about the missing person case. I've tried to get him to talk, but he says he can't say a word to anybody but the boss. Well, you better take him up to Gene's office. Or maybe the governor would be better. But he might know something of that. You better send him in. Yes, sir. All right. Yeah, you can see him now. Yeah, sir. Yeah, sir. Thank you, sir. That'll do, Barnes. Well, what can I do for you? Is you sure you was the head, head man? Well, I am for this department, yes. Well, can I see you alone, please? Well, don't worry about Captain Stenslin here. He can hear anything you can tell me. Now, what's your name? Elijah Jones, Paul Gianna. I mean, sir. Where do you live? Well, I just moved the other day. I used to live on East, East 45th, but now we just a second. I thought that new number wrote that. Well, I guess we can do without that for the present. What's troubling you? Well, sir, I've heard two fellas in the street talking something about them having found the body of an unadden un of a woman. Well, that's right. How does that affect you? Did you come here to tell us that you killed somebody? Oh, no, no. I didn't say that. I never took nobody. I didn't. 
She don't think I'd come here if I'd done something like that. Mm-hmm. How do we know you're not just a smart criminal trying to pull the wool over our eyes? Oh, I ain't. I swear I ain't. Now, look here, Mr. Kemp. I never came here to fool nobody. No how. All I want is to find out about this here wool. All right, Jones Ford. Don't get excited. I see now that I was mistaken. You couldn't be a murderer. Thank you. Probably a bank robber. What's that? <laughs> Never mind. Go ahead with your story. Well, Mr. Kevin's like this. Rose, Rose had to go over to Phoenix for a couple of weeks to visit her sister. Rose? Who's Rose? My fiancée. I mean, she was my fiancée. You see, she had to go to Phoenix while she was away. Tom Mark wanted me to go out with her one night. And I go along. I didn't know he was going to have girls along, too. And every time I get there... They was with him. What could I do? Uh, uh, you were a uh, helper. That's right. Mr. Other Captain, I was. Yes. And Rose found out about it when she got back. And now she did it too. I can't find no place. No, sir. And when I heard about some girl being found, I thought maybe when she was hard as broke, she was going out with some other guy. And he done kill her or something. Or kill me. I got a picture out here. This is the gal they found me in his life, too. Here, don't you want it? Well, I'm afraid that won't be necessary, Jones Ford. You see, the girl couldn't be your rose. She was a a blonde girl. Oh. Oh. A blonde girl? Sorry, we can't help you. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you might give Rose a description to the fellow at the desk out there as we go by. We'll see if we can locate her. That would be good of you, sir. Thank you. Poor guy. If I'd known he was that sensitive, I wouldn't have kidded him. Uh, he does seem to have taken it hard. Yeah, yeah, but that's not getting the case down. Yes? Now, oh, what's this? More distressed citizens looking for roses? No, sir. Another missing report that just came in. Thought you'd be interested. Yeah, let's see it. Now, that'll do. Thanks. What is it? Hmm. This is Laura B. Sutton reported missing to police department. A missing person's detail has checked it and found... Hey, wait a minute. She's a blonde. She had a physician friend. Oh, but this wouldn't be the one. She was over 30. Remember, the coroner reported that he believed the age to be near 30. And after all, he can't be very exact. Well, this report tells me pretty close. Closer than any of the others. Any hair samples sent in? No. What do you say we go out to this address? I've got a hunch this might be a lead. Accompanied by a deputy sheriff, Captain Wright and Stensman drive to Mrs. Sutton's address. As they ring the doorbell, they receive a surprise. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be anyone at home. I'll say there isn't. Look in this window. There's no furniture in the job. Well, I'll be... Hey, have you got a skeleton key? Yeah. Let's see if we can get this door open. Yeah, this one won't do. Uh, no, this one. How about that one there? We'll see. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Oh, so all the furniture's been moved out. Wonder where the bedroom is. Looks like this might be it. Uh-huh. Yeah, no hairbrush to get combing from. Already? Yes, sir. Look around the kitchen cupboard and see if you can find a broom or something. Yes, sir. Not a stick of furniture left. Anything about that in the report you got from the brother of Mrs. Sutton? Not a thing. And look here, in the threshold between the bedroom and the bathroom. What? A dark stain. Blood? Maybe. You got your testing chemicals with you? Yes. Now, well, you better try it out. I couldn't find the room, Captain, but here's an old carpet we said that was laying out back. No, that's even better. Let me have it. Thanks. Now, you better look around all these rooms and see if you can pick up any fingerprints or other clues. Yes, sir. Are you coming with a blood test, Stanton? Give me time. Okay. I'm going to see what sort of evidence this carpet sweeper will collect from the floor of my lady's boudoir. <laughs> Hours later, F.B. Gompert, the sheriff's office technician, makes the report to Captain Wright and Stenson. Well, Gompert? I've examined the hairs you picked up in the carpet sweeper. Yes, what did you find? In the capillary canal in the hair found on the victim, and the hairs you showed me are distinct and similar. All of the characteristics of the hairs are similar, and my conclusion is that the hairs you obtained and the single one from the victim come from the same person. Good. And how about the stain I tested? Do you check with me? Yes, one of my assistants subjected the sliver of wood you brought in to a laboratory test. We found the stain to have been made by human blood. And we have a reasonable basis for assuming that our victim is Mrs. Laura B. Sutton. Yes, but this blood and hair identification still wouldn't be sufficient to hang anyone for a murder. True enough, but at least it's progress. Right, and our next step is to find out everything we can about this mysterious Mrs. Sutton. Get on that right away, Stenson. Yes, sir. 
Carefully, the investigating officers delve into Mrs. Sutton's past. From a hundred individuals, they gather scraps of information, elusive pieces, and a jigsaw puzzle which slowly takes form. Proves nothing, seems hopeless. Since they are still uncertain as to the identity of their victim, and nothing they discover strengthens their conviction that they are on the right track. And then, one Saturday afternoon, six weeks after the body had been found, two small boys are playing in the Los Angeles River bed. Heck, Slim, there ain't enough water down here to go wading. No, I guess you're right, Tom. You, you don't even get your feet wet. What'll we do then? Let's dig for gold, huh? Dig for gold? Aw, oh, there ain't no gold around here. Sure there is. There's lots of gold in California. And they always find it in riverbed. That's what my geography book says. My geography book don't say nothing about it. Well, that's because you're still in A5. When you get into B6 like I am, then you'll read all about it. Well, where is the gold? Any place along here. We just dig in the sand, and when we find something that shines, then that's gold. Yeah? Sure. Here, grab one of these sharp sticks and we'll start digging. Okay. How much gold do you think we'll find, Slim? Oh, you can't tell. Maybe a million dollars worth. Maybe five. Hmm, that'd be enough to get a bicycle, wouldn't it? Almost. Hey, Slim, I hit something already. Maybe it's a big hunk of gold. Let's see. Sure, look at it shine. Looks like gold, all right. They're going to rock. Come on, big like the dickens. Slim, Slim, this isn't a rock. What is it? The skull, Slim, with the gold tooth in it. Gee, I bet it's a pirate skull, Slim. Maybe. Let's put it on a stick and have a pirate parade. Sure, and we can scare all the kids. Sure we can. Here's the stick here. Come on. Oh, 14 men on a dead man's chest. Yo, ho, ho, ain't a bottle of rum. Come on, let's cut back to Mrs. Green so we'll go down the corner where the rest of the kids are. All right. 14 men on a dead man's chest. Yo, ho, ho, ain't a bottle of rum. Come on, let's cut back to Mrs. Green so we'll go down the corner where the rest of the kids are. All right. 14 men on a dead man's chest. Yo, ho, ho, ain't a bottle of rum. Mr. Who heavens, what have you boys cut on that stick? A pirate stuff. You put that thing down this minute. Well, it's on. Keep coming. You boys put that down or I'll call the police. Yeah. 14 men on a dead man's chest. Mrs. Green calls the sheriff's office and deputies quickly intercept the two boys and take their grinning skull away from them. A few hours later, Captain Bright and Dr. Wagner, the county autopsy surgeon, examine the grisly find in the county morgue. I've already made a charge of the thief. Noted the dental work. Good. If you let me have copies, I'll have my men check with every dentist in town. The copies will be ready in a few minutes. While you're waiting, I'd like to call your attention to a very interesting thing about this head. Yes? I'm convinced, Captain, that this head belongs on the unidentified torso we've had in here for six weeks. You are? Why? Because this skull fits perfectly on our headless torso. It does? Yes, sir. And the marks made by the cutting instruments match on the top vertebra of the torso and on the skull. In that case, we may not have the canvas all the dentist in Los Angeles. We'll begin with the dentist who worked on the teeth of Mrs. Laura Sutton. From Mrs. Sutton's brother, Captain Bright discovers the name of her dentist. And from this dentist, he receives a positive identification of the bridge work in the mysterious skull as work he had done for Mrs. Sutton. While deputies intensify their search for the other missing members of Mrs. Sutton's body, Denson and Bright plan their next move. Well, Stenson, point one of our job has been accomplished. We've identified the body. Right. Now all we've got to do is find the murderer. Looks like we've got a pretty nice list of suspects to start on. Let's begin with this taxi driver. What's his name? Walter Black. He roomed above Mrs. Sutton's garage. You questioned him. Do you think there was anything between them? I don't know. He seemed to have a pretty clear conscience. Mm, he last saw on March 28th, six days before the body was found. we better put him down for a little more questioning. Okay. Who's next? Miss uh, Dr. Wesley. He claims to have a bill of sale for Mrs. Sutton's furniture. Mm, yes, he's the guy who moved all her furniture out of the house after she disappeared. That looks bare in the face of it. Woman disappears, man empties house. Mark him, suspect. Right. And there's Mrs. Sutton's sister. And... Oh, yes, we better talk to Sutton himself. According to information I received, Mrs. Sutton was gunning him for alimony. Very well. Now we've got a nice piece of work cut out for ourselves. Several suspects, but 
I wonder about the motive. Mrs. Martin, you are the sister of Mrs. Lola B. Sutton, are you not? I am. You know where your sister is? I do not. We have reason to believe that your sister was murdered. Do you? You knew she was missing, did you not? No, I didn't. Mrs. Martin, did you murder your sister? Of course not. Did Mr. Sutton murder her? Oh, I'm sure he wouldn't do that. Have you any idea who did it? Uh, you might talk to Walter Black, that taxi driver who lived near her. You mean lived over the garage? Well, have it any way you like, but talk to Walter Black. He was sweet on her. He thought he was going to marry her someday. Before. I tell you, it ain't so. It's a lie. I was at the border at Mrs. Sutton. I lived there for two years. Slipped in the room over the garage and took my meals with Mrs. Sutton in the house. When did you last see Mrs. Sutton? Well, on the night of March 20, I seen the lights in her room. When I come home from work, get it? About 4 a.m. You're sure that she was alive up to March 28th? Yeah. Did you kill her? What is it, a frame? You're not. Who did? You're asking me. I don't know nothing. Have you any suspicion? No. But Dr. West makes money. On account of he was keen on her. All the time calling her and taking her places. Ask the doctor, lady. Well, so I admired Mrs. Sutton very much. Met her in 1927. I never crossed the threshold of a door until she got a divorce last year. I believe in observing the society. Yes. When did you see Mrs. Sutton last? On the afternoon of March 28th. I drove to the corner of Hobart in West Adams. She said she was going to get a streetcar to the station, take a train to Ventura. Try to get some back alimony out of her house. Why did you take Mrs. Sutton's furniture out of her house? I had a bill of sale for it. She sold the furniture to me. What is that bill of sale? I, I don't know. I... I must have lost. Dr. Westlake, did you kill Mrs. Sutton? I know. Of course not. Who did? I don't know. Do you know anyone who might know? Well, he was a former husband. She was trying to get back out of money from him. Maybe he. Why, it's ridiculous. I don't know a thing about Laura. I haven't seen her since we were divorced a year ago. No, I did not kill her. Why should I want to kill her? I had nothing against her. Our life together was over. However, she chose to live her life with her own business. Well, Simpson, what do you think of the fish we caught in our net? Yeah, a nice bunch. But they're all pretty clear, excepting one. Who's that? This Dr. Wesley. He protests too much. I think you're right. You want to make a bet about him? What? I'll bet you he'll hang himself. All he needs is enough rope. And two days later, Dr. Westlake walks into Captain Bright's office. Well, Dr. Westlake, what brings you back? Captain, I've got some very important information for you. What's that? Information that seems to prove that Mrs. Hutton is not there. Well, what is it? This letter. Here. Let me see. My dear, what did you do with the furniture and the birdies? It's stored where? Is Mr. Black still in town, and what shift is he working? Please answer these questions in any of the personal columns. We'll see you soon. Signed, LBS. Where would you get this? This morning. Mrs. Hutton, all right. Oh, well, that's very interesting. What do you make of it, Simpson? Well, she must be hiding something. Yeah, that'll be my guess. Well, what shall I do about it? Follow the directions by all means. Put the advertisement in the personal columns answering her questions. And ask her to get in touch with you. As soon as you hear from her, let us know. Very well, I'll do that. I I felt sure you'd know what to advise, Captain. Of course, Dr. Westlake. We're glad to be of assistance. Good day, Captain. Good day, Doctor. I guess he isn't using up the rope. <laughs> I'll see. Why, well, that old buzzard has got a guilty conscience that sticks out all over him. He must think we're correspondence school dicks to bring in a piece of tripe like that typewritten birdie note and expect us to fall for it. If Mrs. Sutton's alive, then I'm really that headless fossil. Now, look, Stenson. I want you to get a couple of good men working on Westlake. Dig into his private affairs and see what you can get on him. And work fast. Yes, sir. I'll get on it right away. <laughs> Deputy Sheriff Allen and Gray are assigned to the investigation of Dr. Westlake's affairs. And after carefully obtaining their information, they submit it to Captain Bright, who asks Dr. Westlake to call at his office. Thanks for coming down, Doctor. Not at all. I'm glad to help in any way I can. Yes, I'm sure you are. Tell me, did you receive an answer to that ad you put in the personal column? No, I didn't. Mm, that's strange. Possibly Mrs. Sutton had gone out of town. Perhaps. I'm sure I can't understand why she should send me the note and then fail to answer me. No, it's all quite mysterious. By the way, Doctor, there are some other mysterious things which have come to our attention we'd like to ask you about. Of course. We understand that you had a joint bank account with Mrs. Sutton. Is that correct? Yes. That account at one time held $700. How much of that money did you deposit, Doctor? Why, 
don't remember exactly. Isn't it true, Doctor, that you only deposited less than $100 of that amount? Uh, I really don't know. I, I don't remember. Yet we've discovered that almost all of that money was withdrawn by you, Doctor. Oh, well, that's perfectly all right. It's a joint account. Yes, but it was Mrs. Sutton's money. Well, you see, I can explain that. It's really very simple. <laughs> it was this way. I drew that money for various of Mrs. Sutton's expenses. You drew it for her expenses. Why didn't you draw her own money? Well, you see, it's trying to get alimony from her husband so he wanted to conceal her assets. Well, I see. That's a very ingenious scheme. Yes, and Mrs. Sutton is a smart woman. I imagine so. Then there's a matter of a deed, Doctor. What about that? What deed? That deed to a lot in Westwood. I don't know anything about any deed. Don't you? Here, look at this. Refresh your memory. This deed was made out to you by Mrs. Sutton. Oh. oh, yes, yes. I had forgotten all about it. So soon? Yet this deed was only recorded the day before Mrs. Sutton's body was found. What are you driving at? What do you mean? Nothing. Nothing to get excited that, about. That uh, deed was part of Mrs. Sutton's scheme to, to conceal assets. That lot was, well, we were going to be married. We were going to build our home on that lot. I see. Then there's the matter of these four shares of stock belonging to Mrs. Sutton on which you borrowed money since her disappearance. What about them? What do you mean, what about them? How could Mrs. Sutton have signed them after we found her body in the riverbed? You didn't find her body. She isn't dead. Apparently not, since she signed these. How did you manage it, Doctor? I didn't manage anything. I, uh, she signed those shares of stock. How? Well, I had to borrow money on them for some business of ours, and the bank said they had to have her endorsement. I sent the shares to Holbrook, Arizona. Why? Well, she had some friends in Holbrook, and I thought she might be there. Was she? <laughs> Apparently. The shares came back from Holbrook a few days later, and they were signed. And then she was in Holbrook. Uh, yes, I guess so. You're getting a little mixed up, Doctor. You've been talking about Holbrook, Arizona, and then calling it Holbrook. Just what do you mean? Uh, Holbrook. Holbrook, yes. That's the name of the place. <laughs> no wonder I'm getting mixed up with all these silly questions. You were a little mixed up when you signed those shares of stock, weren't you, Doctor? What do you mean? I mean they're forgeries. Very bad forgeries of Mrs. Sutton's handwriting. Executed by yourself. No, no, that's all wrong. I've been acting in good faith. I wouldn't forge a signature. It's our belief you'd do a lot more. It's our belief that you murdered Mrs. Sutton. No, I didn't. I swear I didn't. You first obtained all her property, and then you did away with her. You murdered her and dissected the body in her house and then dumped it into the Los Angeles River. No, no, no. 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 That's our reconstruction, and we're submitting the evidence tomorrow, asking the grand jury to charge you with murder. You can't do this to me. I'm going to get help. I'm going to get an attorney. You can't railroad me. Wait a minute. Not so fast. You're not going anyplace. Why? What do you mean? You're staying right here until the grand jury returns a true bill. We're holding you on a charge of suspicion of murder. of 1929 he went on trial for murder. After an exciting trial in which scores of witnesses testified, Dr. Westlake was found guilty, and on September 17th, Judge Walton Wood sentenced him to life imprisonment in San Quentin Penitentiary. Thank you, Justice Lewis. Ladies and gentlemen, at no extra cost to you, Tetraethyl fluid is added to Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Because of the elaborate refining equipment needed for Rio Grande's cracking process, it costs four per gallon to make Rio Grande cracked. But it costs you no more. You get greater value when you drive into the independent service station that sells Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl. You get the same gasoline that is now specified exclusively by the cities of Oakland, Berkeley, Fresno, Los Angeles, and by San Diego County and Maricopa County, Arizona. The authorities of these communities have found that no other gasoline on this market can give such speed, such power, and such economical operation as Rio Grande Crack. Why don't you use the same gasoline police cars use? <laughs> Calling all cars, attention all cars. The cancellation broadcast 91 regarding an unidentified torso. The body has been identified and the murderer is now in custody. That's all. Rolls and clips. <laughs> Read a 
about the true detective stories on this program and the calling all cars new. Get your free copy at any Rio Grande service station. This is your narrator, Frederick.